YouTube, what is good? It is your boy Flex. And put your muscles up, cause we back with another video. So in today's video, man, we're gonna be reacting to the life, fights, and crimes of Lightning Lee Murphy. Go ahead and cut out all the chit chat, man. Grab your headphones, turn the volume up, get that full experience. Let's get into the video. Let's watch it. Let's go. <laughs> Lee Murray's responsible. He was one part of the biggest armed yeah, robbery in the history that's of England. That's yeah. What it was. Now he's, he's still he in, in jail. Jail in Morocco. Yep. Morocco. He, he gotta go pregnant from jail. What? Stolen from Cash Depot, an armed robbery. Jeez. Lightning Lee Murray, part time cage fighter, full time gangster, a heavy hitter in the octagon, and an equally heavy hitter in the London underworld. A man with such a fearsome reputation that police in London were advised to avoid him. From UFC fighter with a bout against Anderson Silva on his record to being the mastermind behind the biggest cash robbery in world history. This is the true story of Lee Murray's crazy life from beginning to end. Lee Murray's road to infamy began in South East London where he was born in 1977 to a British mother and a Moroccan father. The young Lee Murray had a penchant for violence from a very early age. While attending primary school, he and kids from his estate banded together to form the Buttmarsh Boys, named after the Buttmarsh estate they lived on. The Buttmarsh Boys frequently engaged in brawls with kids from other estates with the aim of defending Buttmarsh in a childlike version of a turf war. When he wasn't fighting in the streets, the young Lee Murray was fighting at home with his father, who was often drunk and very violent to the point he'd been warned by police for mistreating his children. Lee would fight back against his father, but with no success until the day he snapped and knocked his father out cold with a single punch. Lee's next door neighbor at the time believes it was this knockout of his father that turned Lee into the extremely violent man he was to become. Once he realized he could take out a man of his father's size at such a young age, his confidence and cockiness grew massively. Lee's father eventually moved out of the family home, fearing that if he didn't, the fights with his son would eventually result in death. Lee Murray entered secondary school where he would meet his best friend and literal partner in crime, Paul Allen. Lee was a terrible student and teachers found him unmanageable, leading him to eventually be expelled from the school. He completed his required education at a different school, but by now was more focused on fully immersing himself into London's criminal underworld, with stealing and drug dealing his careers of choice. Lee took his first rise up the ranks of crime when he and his friends in the Buttmarsh Boys gang became embroiled in a turf war against a gang of Nigerian drug dealers who had mugged Lee's friends and stolen their wallets and phones. The Buttmarsh Boys responded with swift and extreme violence and ended up chasing the Nigerian gang out of their area. With the Nigerians defeated, the Buttmarsh Boys inherited the territory and drug trade that they had left behind and Lee began selling drugs on a larger scale. He also gained a reputation as a fierce debt collector, more than happy to resort to violence against those who didn't pay him on time. Together with his associate, Mark the Beast Epstein, Lee began to make serious money selling crack cocaine, but this increased success brought him increased attention from the police, and he was eventually caught and sent to Feltham Young Offenders Institution after police found them in possession of cocaine and marijuana. After his release from Felton, Lee developed a fanatical obsession with weightlifting as he sought to add muscle to his skinny six foot three frame and he was joined in the gym by best mate Paul Allen who by this time had earned himself the nickname of The Enforcer for his work in the drug dealing business. The pair began to use steroids leading to seriously impressive and intimidating physiques which no doubt aided them in their chosen profession of drug dealing and debt collecting in which they were both becoming increasingly successful. By this point they were driving very flashy cars, buying expensive clothes and throwing wild parties. Naturally this sort of behaviour attracted more attention from police, but it was here that Lee began to develop a reputation for slipping through the net and getting away with crimes that others couldn't. Lee Murray would frequently taunt and intimidate police officers and a failed attempt at placing an informant into Lee's gang only encouraged this behaviour. Lee was known to occasionally follow police officers around in his car 
and some officers were warned by their superiors that it was best to avoid aggravating him as he was considered a very dangerous and threatening man. See, like, when you give a person like that, you know, that type of sense of entitlement, like, oh, you better not want to mess with him, you know what I mean? They're going to thrive off of that, you know? And they're going to take that little inch that you're giving them and they're going to run a mile with it, you know what I mean? And again, this guy's life story, it already starts off with the same... You know what I mean? Same trend that we've seen once and twice and three times and four times. You know what I mean? Just again and again and again, we see the same trend. Young man growing up in a in a drunken, abusive household. You know, he he resorts to these crimes. His friends are, uh, you know, surrounded by crime as well, and and they just adapt to it. And eventually, they become to enjoy those things. You know, they be that becomes the way of life for them. And and some people, you know, it's not even about it's not even about survival at that point. It's it it really is just about entertainment. You know. It's crazy to me. He would display his ability to avoid justice in January 1999, when in the midst of a turf war with a rival gang, police jailed more than a dozen of Lee's associates, including Mark Epstein, who was locked up for three years. Remarkably, despite the fact that he was a major player in the gang and known to police, Lee slipped through the net and remained on the streets while people who were less involved served time in prison. This narrow escape from prison, combined with the birth of his first child, could have potentially been the inspiration for Lee to enter the world of cage fighting, as he started training martial arts not long after these events. A veteran of many street fights, Lee Murray took to the sport quickly, particularly the striking element, and he had his first official fight after less than six months of training in May 1999. It was this fight that earned Lee his nickname of Lightning, as he knocked out opponent Rob Hudson in the first round, leading to the event promoter to remark that his punches were as quick as lightning. And with that quote, Lightning Lee Murray was born, and his successful debut encouraged Lee to begin... <laughs> Why is this guy looking at him like that, bro? What's wrong, <laughs> What's wrong with him? ...in training more seriously. He started to run more frequently and began attending two gyms to train, Peacock's gym to work on his striking, and London Shoot Fighters to hone his severely lacking ground game. With this increased training regimen, Lee had a big year in 2000 with four fights. His first fight of the year displayed the work he'd put into his ground game as he won via Kimura submission in the first round against a fighter with a career two wins, five losses. On the face of it, this may seem like a fairly unremarkable win, but Lee would later divulge some extraordinary details of his preparation for the fight on MMA forum Sherdog. The night before the fight, Lee was in a pub watching a Prince Nazim Hamid fight when a man moved in front of him, blocking his view of the TV. This started an argument which quickly escalated and led to a fight that ended with Lee Murray knocking the man, his friend and a barman out cold. After legging it from the pub before police could arrive, Lee realised he was unable to close his left hand and had broken it in the scuffle. With his fight scheduled the next day, his friend tried to convince him to pull out but Lee decided to fight anyway, and despite only being able to use his right hand, he was still able to secure the win. A fairly unconventional way of getting ready for a fight, that's for sure. Despite that win coming via submission, Lee still felt his ground game wasn't up to scratch. The UK has a rich history of producing world-class boxers, but there isn't a strong wrestling or jiu-jitsu culture here like there is in other countries. This leads to a lot of British MMA fighters getting demolished when facing an opponent whose strength is their ground game. With this in mind, Lee packed his bags and headed for Iowa to train at the renowned Militich Fighting Systems Camp, ran by a renowned wrestler and former UFC champion Pat Militich. Among those training at the gym was UFC legend Robbie Lawler, who paid tribute to the world-class punching power of the Brit, saying it sounded like gunfire when he was hitting the pads. Away from the distractions of his life in London, Lee focused on his training and worked hard to try and fix the holes in his game. While in America, Lee entered a four-man tournament in Wisconsin in which he would suffer the first loss of his career. After a round one victory in his first fight, he was submitted via armbar in the final, highlighting the deficiencies still present in his ground game. With his record standing at three wins, one loss, Lee returned to England having blown through all the money he'd brought with him to Iowa. Murray had one final fight to round the year 2000 off with a bizarre no contest result after his opponent collapsed due to exhaustion in the very first round. Lee continued to fight regularly in 2001 and added a draw and a win to his record, making him England's most famous MMA fighter at the time. This reputation would become cemented 
when arguably the most famous fight of Lee Murray's career occurred. Fittingly, the fight that would put Lee on the UFC's radar wasn't a sanctioned bout in the octagon, but instead a street fight against a UFC champion. Lee attended the UFC's first ever London event, headlined by Pat Miletic trained fighter Matt Hughes. Following the conclusion of the event, an after-party with the fighters was held at London nightclub Funky Buddha, a tradition in the UFC, with the attendees including the likes of Pat Miletic, Chuck Liddell and Tito Ortiz. At closing time, one of Tito Ortiz's friends gave Pat Miletic a playful bear hug from behind as a joke. However, this was misinterpreted by Lee's best friend Paul Allen as an attack on Miletic, and Allen responded by knocking Ortiz's friend out cold. This knockout triggered absolute carnage as fights broke out everywhere. In the midst of the absolute mayhem that included Chuck Liddell knocking out people left and right, a furious Tito Ortiz squared off with Lee Murray, seeking revenge for his friend who had just been punched. Facing off in an alleyway, Tito threw a left hook that narrowly missed Murray. Lee Murray responded with a five punch combination with every punch connecting, then knocked Ortiz out and dropped him to the floor. What? Lee followed up with two kicks to the head before being pulled away. The UFC's light heavyweight champion of the world had just been knocked out by an up and coming British middleweight, and as news of the fight spread it sent shockwaves around the MMA world, massively enhancing Lee's reputation. To this day, Tito Ortiz still disputes that he was knocked out, however this is contradicted by witnesses like Miletic and Matt Hughes, who assert that Lee Murray did indeed knock out the UFC's light heavyweight king. Uh, Lee got out of the way of all the punches, threw a five punch combo back at Tito, every punch landed. Um, very hard punches and Tito went down, uh, landed on his face unconscious and Lee started to punch him in the head with his steel toed boots on. Oof. Lee capitalized on the buzz his fight with Ortiz had created with three straight wins, each win only increasing the calls for the UFC to sign him. One of these wins coming after just four seconds by the way of knockout. Lee's friends stormed the ring to celebrate leading to a massive table topping riot in the arena. This led to the event promoter urging Lee to be banned from the sport as his people were too crazy. With his record standing at 6 wins, 1 loss and 1 draw, Lee faced off against Brazilian fighter Jose Landy Johns, or Pele as he was more commonly known, in July 2003. This fight took place in London and another Lee Murray knockout sent the crowd absolutely crazy with some of the wildest celebrations I've ever seen from an MMA crowd. In his post-fight interview, Lee implored the UFC to sign him, stating that they had to take him now, and they finally listened. Six months later, Lee got the call from the UFC he'd been waiting on, and a fight with Jorge Rivera was booked for Las Vegas. Lee Murray was about to fulfill a long-held dream and had the opportunity to turn fighting into a legitimate career. Lee Murray's UFC debut came at UFC 46 in January 2004 and he chose to wear a Silence of the Lambs mask and orange jumpsuit for his walkout, which would prove oddly prophetic later in life. The fight started with Rivera scoring a takedown on Lee, which earlier in his career would have been a nightmare scenario, but the work he'd put in to improve his wrestling and jiu-jitsu paid off as he locked in an armbar and hyperextended Rivera's elbow, forcing him to tap. Lee Murray had officially arrived on the world stage and looked set to put the UK on the map for MMA, two years before a certain Michael Bisping would make his UFC debut. Lee used his post-fight interview with Joe Rogan to call out former foe Tito Ortiz, who was in attendance for the fight, getting a huge pop from the crowd in the process. The future genuinely did look bright for Lee in the UFC, but unfortunately his gangster lifestyle would catch up with him and end his UFC career before it ever really got started. A few months after his UFC triumph, Lee was arrested and charged with grievous bodily harm stemming from a road rage incident that left the victim in a coma. The incident had actually occurred before his UFC debut and Lee had hidden the fact that he was under investigation from the UFC. While this prosecution was ongoing, Lee was unable to secure a US visa and with the UFC not regularly yet holding events internationally, Lee's career in the UFC was effectively over, and the $78,000 contract he'd been offered was gone. The charge was eventually thrown out when the jury failed to reach a verdict, but Lee was still unable to get a US visa, and opted to sign with UK-based promotion Cage Rage to continue his MMA career. Lee's first fight in Cage Rage would come against none other than UFC legend and future Hall of Famer Anderson Silva. The build-up to this fight was very intense, with Anderson Silva remarking that Lee talked an incredible amount of shit, 
and the weigh-in almost ended in violence. The fight itself was a close affair with Lee giving a good account of himself in a narrow points loss, taking his record to 8 wins, 2 losses and a draw. This was a loss that would look better with time as Anderson Silva went on to conquer the UFC and cement himself as one of the best fighters of all time. If Lee could hang with someone as talented as Anderson Silva, then surely he had a promising future in MMA, right? Well no, because once again Lee's gangster lifestyle would catch up with him, and this time it would end his mixed martial arts career permanently. At the same funky Buddha nightclub where he'd fought with Tito Ortiz, Lee was involved in the scuffle that resulted in him being stabbed and one of his nipples being sliced off. You'd think he might avoid the funky Buddha for a while after this attack, but no, he went back the very next weekend for the birthday party of glamour model Lauren Pope. At some point yet another brawl involving Lee broke out and Lee was stabbed repeatedly in the chest, suffering life-threatening wounds far more serious than he'd got on the previous weekend. With blood shooting out of his chest, Lee was rushed to hospital where he had to be resuscitated four times and barely escaped with his life. Wow. Lee's life was saved thanks to nurses running bags of blood to the hospital to replace the eight pints of blood he had lost. Three weeks after this almost fatal stabbing, somehow Lee was back in the gym training for a comeback, but he would never fight professionally again. His body was covered in scars from stab and gunshot wounds, and promoters were less willing to take the risk of letting him fight, particularly as MMA was slowly moving into the mainstream. Knowing his chances of an elite level MMA career were over, Lee Murray decided to focus his energy into his original career choice, crime, and in a way that would send shockwaves around the globe with a world record setting heist. It's, it's it's so it's, it's so sad, bro. It's like all that potential, all that potential. You know what I mean? But it's like it's it's very simple. It's a very simple concept, a very simple concept, and a lot of people for some reason can't grasp it. <clears throat> Stay out of trouble. Stay out of trouble, bro. I don't know why that's such a hard thing to, for people to grasp, but just stay out of trouble. You know, you you know what kind of future you have, right? You know the potential you have. Stay out of trouble. You know, if you get into trouble at, at one place and then the next week you decide to go back, you are literally putting yourself in a predic predicament to get in more trouble. It's like, come on, man. You're shooting yourself in your foot. You're shooting yourself in the foot. February 21st, 2006 seemed like any other day for Colin Dixon. He'd woken up at 6.30 a.m. sharp as usual, he'd had his breakfast, and then he'd made the hour-long journey to his workplace, the Securitas Cash Depot in Tunbridge, Kent. Colin was manager of the Cash Depot, and after handing over responsibility to the night shift manager, he clocked out and began to make the hour-long journey home to have dinner with his family. Colin was about halfway home and driving through a small and quiet village, when a car behind him began flashing its headlights at him and then turned on blue police lights. Assuming he was being pulled over by an unmarked police car, Colin stopped his vehicle and pulled over to the side of the road, wondering what on earth he could have done to get pulled over. A man in full police uniform hopped out of the car and instructed Colin to get into the back of the police vehicle as he informed him the police had received several reports that Colin had been caught speeding. Colin was immediately handcuffed and joined in the back of the car by another man in police uniform who told him, you may have guessed that we are not policemen. Don't do anything silly and you will not get hurt, as he brandished a 9mm pistol to drive the point home. With Colin Dixon kidnapped, the policemen met up with other members of their gang and drove Colin to a countryside farm before setting the next part of their plan into motion. The same policeman drove to Colin's family home and informed his wife that Colin had been involved in a serious accident. When she accepted the policeman's offer of a ride to the hospital with her child to visit her husband, she too had a gun pulled on her and was taken to the same countryside farm where Colin was being held. The gang brought Colin's wife and kids to him so he could see they had also been taken hostage and they demanded full and complete cooperation from him or they would both be killed. With his family's life hanging in the balance, Colin decided to fully cooperate and assist the gang in robbing his workplace. Colin helped them to gain access past the heavy security that surrounded the cash depot and begged his work colleagues not to press any alarms that would alert police. The gang rounded up all of the staff members who might have been able to alert police and tied them up with a member of the crew assigned to keep watch over them. A number of staff were equipped with panic buttons that when pressed would immediately alert police at a station only 300 yards away from the cash depot. 
but when approached by a panic-stricken Colin and informed that his family were being held hostage, they decided against pressing the button and allowed the robbers to remove their alarms. With the staff subdued and no longer an obstacle, the robbers shifted focus onto the main reason they were there, money. The gang had chosen an extremely good time to rob the cash depot as it contained over 200 million pounds of cash, far more than was typically kept in the depot. The gang also had an extraordinary amount of information on the layout and security features of the cash depot, even though its existence was purposefully kept as discreet as possible. Anything the gang didn't already know could be answered by Colin Dixon, who also helped to disable security measures that may have alerted police to the robbery. The gang set about loading as much of the £200 million worth of cash on offer into the lorry they had brought for the job as it could fit. In just under two hours, the gang was able to load an astonishing £53.1 million into the lorry until it was filled to the brim with bundles of cash. Sweaty and exhausted from moving the huge stacks of cash, the gang began to make preparations for their exit, first moving the staff and putting them into the cash cages. Next, Colin Dixon's wife and child were brought into the cash depot and also locked into a cash cage. Next, the gang disposed of anything containing their DNA, including cups that they had been drinking from. Finally, they warned the victims not to try anything silly and threatened them with the various machine guns and pistols they had used for the heist. With everything taken care of, they made their escape in the cars and lorry they had brought to the depot. The gang vanished into the night with every single member now a multi-millionaire. Their victims were so terrified that it took them a while before trying to escape the cages as they feared the gang hadn't left yet. Even after escaping the cages, they were so shell-shocked that they didn't immediately press the alarm to alert police, fearing that the gang could be outside. This was completely irrational as now that the gang was outside of the depot, they had no way of getting back in unless they were let in, but this goes to show how terrified the victims had been. By the time the alarm was raised, the robbers had a 30 minute head start on their escape and were long gone by the time police arrived. The robbers had only spent just over an hour in the depot, but still came away with over 53 million pounds, and it would have been even more if they had fought to bring a bigger lorry. To this- I I'm sorry, yeah, I'm sorry. If you, uh, you, you, you tie me up and you got my wife and my kids, tied up and and you threaten their lives i'm sorry man you can take look, you can take every little every single penny that you find is yours if you can take it take it it's yours as long as my family is safe man i don't even care at that point sorry so i i don't blame him for willingly giving them all the information i don't this day the securitas cash depot robbery <laughs> still ranks as the largest cash robbery in world history and it had been masterminded by none other than Lightning Lee Murray. But pulling off the robbery was one thing. Could they really hide such a massive amount of physical cash from the police? While the heist itself was well planned, well thought out and well executed, everything that came after was anything but. Like a lot of criminals, they hadn't properly planned where they were going to hide the money, and some key elements like disposing of two cars used in the robbery had not been prearranged. The gang had been careful when destroying any evidence in the cash depot, but outside they made amateur mistakes and failed to destroy all evidence, like one robber continuing to use his mobile phone instead of destroying it like the rest of them had. As soon as the robbery made its way to the news, it created a media frenzy like no other, with reporters from every outlet imaginable scrambling to get to Tunbridge for more information on the heist of the century. Predictably, an equally huge police investigation was launched, and within a day police were already hearing rumours that ex-UFC fighter Lee Murray was involved. They also received a huge tip-off that makeup artist Michelle Hogg had been involved in helping to disguise the gang, and immediately went to arrest her. It was here that the plot began to unravel, as while Michelle Hogg was being questioned, a search of her flat revealed numerous pieces of evidence linking several men to the robbery, including a pot of paint with Lee M scrawled onto it. I'll let you guess who Lee M was. Police scored another big win when acting on a tip-off they found a Volvo van linked to two men, Leah Russia and Jetmir Bushpapa, that contained over 1.3 million in cash, a scorpion gun and a balaclava. Bruh, no way did they leave all that stuff in the car, bro. No way, bro. Come on, man. Come on, bro. Like, you ain't never, like, you ain't never watched a crime movie? 
Like they didn't they didn't study. They didn't study before they did this heist. Like you didn't do like no background checks on the people that you're going to have involved in this heist that could potentially throw your whole life away. You know what I mean? I need to make sure that everybody in my heist has an IQ of at least 500, bro. 500, bro. I don't even care. I don't even care. That's not even a real number of IQ, bro. But it got to be at least that high, bro. Like, I have to know you're a fucking genius. You know what I mean? If I've been trusting you with my life, my freedom, you got to be Albert Einstein. Subsequent police raids on Leah Russia and Jetmir Bushpapa's addresses brought up more damning evidence, like Jetmir's car sat nav having Colin Dixon's address in its search history. But that was nothing compared to what they found at Leah Russia's address, where police discovered a hand drawn plan of the Securitas cash depot under his bed. Needless to say, that both of these men were part of the gang that robbed Securitas, and their litany of mistakes had led police right to them within days of the robbery. With two members of the gang identified, police nabbed another when Stuart Royal was arrested after police found car keys for the cars used in the robbery at his mother's house. Another rookie error, highlighting how little planning had gone into the aftermath of the robbery. Within a week of the robbery, the police had made six arrests of suspected gang members and accomplices and had obtained damning evidence against them. Additionally, they'd identified an employee of the cash depot Emir Heisenaj is the inside man who had supplied the robbers with the inside information that had allowed them to pull off the heist. However, there was one pair whose names kept coming up that the police were having trouble tracking down. The net was now closing in rapidly on the robbers, and police were now focused on two key names they'd been hearing were heavily involved in the robbery. These key suspects were none other than Lee Murray and Paul Allen. Unlike the rest of the gang, however, this pair sensed they were running on borrowed time and hastily made their escape to France and eventually Amsterdam via Channel Crossing Ferry. Lee had associates in the Netherlands from time spent training over there, but it was not his intended final destination. After laundering some of the dirty cash they had brought with them, Murray and Allen drove to Spain. Back in the UK, police were trying to find out where the pair had fled to, a search of Lee Murray's house found a phone in his Ferrari with a recording of him talking to Leah Rusher about the robbery, all but confirming that Lee had been one of the robbers. But while police were collecting evidence, Murray and Allen were again on the move, this time to their final destination of Morocco. As mentioned at the start of the video, Lee's father was Moroccan, and Lee's full name of Lee Brahim Murray Lamrani was Moroccan, and this meant that he had a claim to Moroccan nationality. This was the crucial factor for the pair choosing to flee to Morocco because Morocco does not have a formal extradition treaty with the United Kingdom and also Morocco does not extradite its citizens. While in Morocco, Lee was essentially out of reach of the British justice system and he'd brought his best mate Paul Allen along for the ride with a suitcase full of cash and plenty more money being laundered through to him. You better not they go wasted back. no time in splashing the cash and both bought mansions with Lee's costing £500,000 in cash with another 200,000 spent on renovations, including this rather tacky mural of Lee's one and only UFC victory against Jorge Rivera. They partied, gambled and shopped hard with daily trips to the local mall in Rabat to purchase items such as a 35,000 pound watch. They routinely flew women out from the UK to visit them and paid for the girls to have cosmetic procedures such as breast enhancements and nose jobs. Their daily trips to the shopping centre saw them blowing around £2,000 per day just on clothes. They were living the life they had always dreamed of and enjoying the fruits of their labour, while thousands of miles away from the chaos in England where arrest after arrest was being made. But paradise wouldn't last for long, and on June 25th, 2006, Lee Murray and Paul Allen were arrested by Moroccan police outside of their favourite shopping centre. The police claimed they had to use specialist techniques to arrest the pair due to their extensive martial arts backgrounds and reputation for firearms. The police search of Murray's mansion in Rabat found hashish and cocaine, the latter an extremely serious offence in a Muslim nation like Morocco. Although British police had requested the arrest of Murray and Allen for the Securitas robbery, they were told their extradition request would have to wait until the drug offences committed in Morocco had been dealt with first. Seven months after their arrest, Murray and Allen were given sentences of eight months in prison for possession of drugs and assaulting police officers during their arrest. With this case now out of the way, the extradition to Britain proceedings could take place. 
Murray's Moroccan lawyer argued that as a Moroccan national, Lee could not be extradited as stated in Moroccan law. He even claimed that Murray couldn't go back to the UK to clear his name as he would be the victim of anti-Arab racism from the British justice system. Paul Allen was also trying to fight extradition despite having no Moroccan heritage and was claiming he wanted to become a Muslim and planned to change his name to Omar. This did not work for Paul Allen and a judge ruled that he was to be extradited back to the UK to face charges related to the robbery, where seven other members of the gang, including inside man Emir Haisenaj, had been found guilty and sentenced to lengthy stretches in prison. Paul Allen later pled guilty to three charges of kidnap, conspiracy to commit robbery and possession of a firearm. However, he was cleared of being one of the gang members who entered the cash depot during the robbery. He was given a sentence of 18 years, of which he would only need to serve half before being released, as well as having the more than three years he had spent in custody in both Morocco and Britain subtracted from the sentence, meaning he would only serve around seven years in prison for the heist. Wow. Murray, on the other hand, was successful in fighting extradition after proving he was a Moroccan national. As a Moroccan national, he could not be extradited, but this did come with a major catch. He was going to be tried for the robbery in Morocco instead. Wow. Feeling he had a better chance of beating the case in Morocco, he went along with it and a trial began. While Murray was unsuccessful in beating the case, the Moroccan courts did give him an extremely light sentence of just 10 years, much less than the life sentences handed out to some of his co-conspirators. Oh yeah, this... oh yeah, I know they're hot bro. I know they have to be so mad. But at the same time, you did it yourself. You shouldn't be so ignorant bro. Like if you're going to commit some crimes, you shouldn't leave the evidence anywhere should be no evidence like keeping the plans under your bed keeping the phone that you use during the heist keeping keeping this at your mom's house keeping that at your uncle's house like what bro everybody deserved to get life everybody deserved to get caught and get life sentence was appealed by the prosecution for being too lenient and was increased to a much more daunting 25 years this was far too long for lee murray who decided to try and escape prison by using small saws he'd had smuggled in to cut through the iron bars of his cell window. To make sure he could fit through the small window, Lee lost a significant amount of weight. However, the plot was discovered when a prisoner broke into Lee's cell to steal belongings and found the saws. Lee was unpopular among his fellow prisoners as they were jealous of the items he'd been able to get into prison, including a laptop with internet access, five kilos of drugs and expensive clothes. Other than his escape attempt, the only other notable piece of news was that he managed to father a child while locked up. To this day, he is still in a Moroccan prison, aged 42, and has given interviews where he still harbors hope of an MMA career when he is finally released. As for Lee's best friend, Paul Allen, he was released in 2015, having served just six years of his 18 year sentence. He was also let off repaying 1.2 million pounds by a judge having made a total repayment of just £420. Nice. He was later photographed by a newspaper with a £7,000 Rolex and a £40,000 car. Needless to say that Paul Allen got off very lightly from his role in the robbery. The other main members of the gang were sentenced to life imprisonment and inside man and Securitas employee Emir Heisnaj was given a 20 year sentence for his role. The story of Lee Murray began in South London, took a brief detour to Las Vegas before ending in a Moroccan prison. His life has been littered with crimes and fights and he's now known as the mastermind and ringleader of the biggest cash robbery in world history. In an interview with MMA outlet Bloody Elbow, Lee Murray crowned himself, not Conor McGregor, as the real notorious one and it's hard to disagree. Lee Murray has had without doubt the wildest life of any UFC fighter past or present and remains a notorious figure to this day. The end. Wow. If you got this far, thank you so much for watching the video. Drop a like and subscribe if you enjoyed it. Also, please consider sharing the video with someone who might enjoy it. As you can see, my channel is... I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Very interesting story, man. Lee Murray is crazy, bro. <clears throat> Lee Murray's crazy. Smart? I don't know, man. I, don't know. I wouldn't say smart. I mean, it, 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 it takes a little bit of brains, to, you know, to, to plan and actually go through with the heist and then not even go through with it, but actually, you know, like come out kind of successful. You know what I mean? Like that night when he committed the robbery, he was successful, successful, you know, successful night. They didn't keep it up, though. You know, that that intelligence only went so far, you know, and, you know, you, you reap what you sow. 
you reap what you sow, man. It's crazy. Crazy, crazy story, man. If you guys enjoyed the video, make sure to give it a thumbs up. Post in the comments down below, guys. And, of course, hit that big red button, man. Man, thank you for the recommendations. Keep posting your video recommendations, man. I do read the comments. I do see. Trust me, I see them. All right? And until next time, man, y'all put your muscles up. I'm out of here. Peace.